everyone to today's SMART seminar and we are talking about commercialisation of waste to energy using plasma gasification. Synergus? Synergus. See, I'm suddenly sure in this field. Synergus. I'm going to learn so much today. Uh, welcome to our two speakers, Wes Lauren and Jerry Grove White. Uh, Wes uh, received his BA in Geography and Earth Sciences from the University of California, Berkeley in 1972 went on to obtain an MSc in Urban and Regional Planning from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. He's had a varied career, including stints as a city planner, managing urban renewal and redevelopment programs for several Californian cities, before moving into financial advisor and investment banking for municipal finance. In 1995, he moved to private sector project finance, successfully completing infrastructure financings in distributed power, bare boat charter, I want to hear what that is, <laughs> mixed use real estate development and other projects around the world. Uh, and his final transition came as a result of work in financing rural power cooperative generation uh, when he was introduced by clients to plasma gasification technology. Eventually he founded LEP Waste to Energy in Australia along with his associates and worked for over a decade with government engineers, private sector waste companies and other experts to advance the commercialisation Waste to Energy as an infrastructure platform. I said it was a varied career. <laughs> uh, Jerry Grove White. No, unfortunately, I'm old enough to have had them. <laughs> yes, it happens. Uh, Jerry's a retired mechanical engineer with 45 years' experience in power generation around the world and extensive project management experience and financing of IPPs, in addition to a wide range of operational engineering experience. He retired in 2010 from his then role as Managing Director of Geodynamics after a career in senior management roles around the world, including managing director of Herrera Energy, i will probably got all that wrong, and Coup of Tata Power, which is India's largest private power company. And he worked for PowerGen in India for 12 years, during which time he was also country director for PowerGen's business in India and managed PowerGen's European generating and mining assets in Germany, Hungary and Portugal. His early career was in the nuclear industry and he worked on Magnox Kandu reactors and the prototype fast reactor at Dawn Ray. I probably got that wrong too. He has a BSc Honours in Mechanical Engineering from City University of London and a Certified Diploma in Accounting and Finance. He currently has non-exec consultancy roles with Adani Mining, Dysol and Eon and a number of startup companies in the energy field. We're very uh, delighted to have you both with us here today. Uh, both gentlemen have said to encourage to ask questions throughout that they very much want this to be a dynamic interchange. So please don't hesitate, don't wait till the end. If you've got a burning question, jump on in. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the smart infrastructure people for hosting this and allowing us to have this dialogue with you this morning. Uh, we're here to talk about, as the title says, the commercialization of wasted energy using the plasma gasification uh, technology. <coughs> We've been at this, well, I've been at this for about 14 years, much prior to actually establishing the company. And I can tell you that uh, it, it, through that journey, nothing was more exciting for us than having Oz Industry provide us with a multi-year first project commercialization award that amounted to $38.5 million. That was the good news. The bad news is we couldn't find anybody to go in Australia to stump up for the equity required. And uh, we'll take a look at the numbers a little later. So without without uh, spending any more time on that subject, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry, and he's going to quickly walk you through the process in this simplified diagram. Uh, good morning, and uh, I'm going to echo Wes's thanks, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Very briefly, uh, when I retired from geodynamics, some mutual friends introduced Wes and I, and Wes sat down for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, exploring the journey you'd been on up to that point. And as soon as he told me uh, that the plasma temperatures were in the range of three to 5,000 degrees, I said, this is the technology that the waste industry has been waiting for. Up until now, incineration, I think it's almost to the stage, incineration 
it is always struggling because it has low temperatures. Plasma is being used, but we'll come to that later, but not directly as a gasification and production of sea gas. So, and it's very simple, we put the waste in, shred up, plasma torches, we add measured amounts of oxygen and on occasions we also add steam in order to get the chemistry of the syngas correct. As it leaves it's at a very high temperature obviously and has to be quenched otherwise it just recombines back to, because these are reversible actions, um, reactions. So it's quenched um, and then scrubbed to remove the inevitable <coughs> hydrochloric acid in particular from the chlorinated hydrocarbons and also any sulfur will manifest itself as uh, sulfuric acid or yeah, sulfuric or sulfuric acid and is wa washed out in the scrubbers. There is then uh, a draft fan, uh, which is forcing it through the heat recovery uh, uh, process, um, and also into the compressors, which we'll come to, which provide the syngas for gas turbines. And this one is shown in the combined cycle configuration. Um, the syngas itself is, is hydrogen, carbon monoxide and nitrogen. Uh, any inorganic material is tapped out of the plasma chambers as uh, a ceramic vitreous material which is then quenched and ground up and is completely inert when it's put into construction materials or things like that. Um, of particular importance and very relevant to Sydney is that it will handle chlorinated hydrocarbons and I don't know if anybody's followed Orica's tragic attempts to get rid of the thousand tons, yeah. oh. thousand tons of organic uh, It's a uh, hundred thousand barrels Terry yeah. 100,000 barrels. They've tried to ship it around the world and quite right with the world said sod off. Uh, we're not having that poison not there. This would be a perfect way of dealing with it. Right now then I'll move. Can I ask questions? Yeah, as we go on, please. So I'd imagine for plasma torches, it requires a lot of energy to operate plasma yeah. torches. How does it compare the energy generated by at the end. Well, can we come to that because we've got mass energy balances yes. that I'll take you through okay. at scale. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean clearly the, <coughs> the plasma torches are heavy consumers of power, but yes it is a positive. Okay. Even at 35 tonnes right. a day, it, it's, it's positive right. in terms of its output, but the bigger you get the better it is from you know, the usual scale. Right, well, so you going to carry on for a bit? Yeah. So, all along, and even now, um, our proposition is to create a sustainable business by recycling select organic waste into cleaner and price competitive energy. Now, select organic waste, in, in, in the case of municipal solid waste, that's refuse derived fuel. That's the RDF that remains after recyclables have taken out after the inorganics are largely taken out, there's always a little bit, uh, usually you know, five, six, seven percent of the, of the material is inorganic, even in the RDF, I mean, uh, yeah, inorganic, even in the RDF. And, um, and then, of course, as Jerry mentioned, there's things like you know, hydrochlorobenzenes, there's, uh, there, there's oil sludge, there's anything organic, basically tires. Um, but we've concentrated our business model because it is such a deep market, we've concentrated our business model over the years on the municipal solid waste cachet of 
refuse-derived fuel and, and associated materials. So, uh, our, and what does this mean? Well, our profitability is based upon market drivers. Market drivers such as how much it costs to tip in New South Wales in terms of the levy, or in Victoria, or in Queensland, etc. How much, uh, uh, how much people are paying for that? Um, how, how can we reduce their bottom line costs? Um, operations. Well, operationally, uh, we're, we're talking about all of our, all of the technologies that combine in the chain we're talking about are, are quote unquote off the shelf technologies. There's no new technology development in any of this. Okay, um, and and of course efficiencies. As Jerry has pointed out, even at uh, 25, 30 tons a day, 30 tons a day for sure, we have a net output of energy, which we'll, we'll take you through. Um, we just as a notation though, we approached it as, with, with all industry, we approached it with a project, we have a site in, in, um, in Cornell, uh, we approached it as a project that would do 405 tons a day. At full scale, that means 135 tons a day per plasma reactor. So there were going to be three reactors, right? Um, environmental benefits, lower greenhouse gases. We completely neutralize methane. Uh, and everybody knows that that's a lot more harmful than CO2. Uh, we completely, uh, we, we generate lower levels of CO2 in our, in our process than just about anything else uh, out there that generates power with any kind of combustion technology uh, because we're using sink gas. Uh, we, we have protection of water tables, we reduce landfills, it's all about reducing landfill. And, uh, and that's where the water tables come in. And we have cleaner distributed energy production. These projects, even at 405 tons a day, our, our for sale amount of power to the grid was, was going to approach 30 megawatts. That's a lot of power, uh, but you'll see why that's the case. And, and at 30 megawatts or less, we don't need to enter into long-term power purchase agreements because legally in Australia, our power must be purchased at that level by the national uh, by the national authority. So we, we are always in the market in projects of 30 megawatts or less. Over 30 megawatts, then we have to enter into uh, PPA and, and have all take agreements. Um, so these are these are drivers that are very powerful drivers and, uh, and we we'll, we'll go into that a little later. Um, lower cost than landfill by nearly 50%. We in our project with all industry uh, we showed that we could take the RDF for $85 to $100 a ton, and at that time, even four or five years ago, they were already paying $180 a ton. This is why the waste companies made their deals that were outed by the news media to, to haul <coughs> their, their waste that they had to put in the ground up to Queensland, dump it for $30, but they were happy to pay $100 to $110 a ton to get it up there, rather than enter into an agreement with us for a larger amount of waste. So there are, uh, there are drags against the concept, but the fact of the matter is we will lower the cost of landfill. Long run marginal cost of power production is less than zero. We had independent analysis from several sources and our own, of course, that show that uh, the economic model that was set up for the project that all industry agreed to fund to obligate the ATO uh, for $38.5 million dollars, that the long range marginal cost of that power was negative because we're taking in the tip fee. This is an infrastructure project. It's not a power project and it's not a waste project. It's an infrastructure project. So there's revenues at both ends. Uh, optimum process for destruction of organohalides such as dioxins and purons. Jerry's, Jerry's touched on this already. This is the major te technological reason to even do this. Because if you're, when you're combusting with other means, coal, natural gas, whatever, you have enormous costs uh, in scrubbers and you still don't take out all this material. Uh, with, with our process and with, with the technology from the technology provider on the plasma, we're able to reduce this to virtually zero. Virtually. Very, very, very close. So what contributes to our proposition as a sustainable business model? Well, we have to have availability of feedstock, right? Obviously. 
We have to, and we currently, there are more than three million tons, it's closer to three and a half million tons per year of RDF generated in New South Wales alone. That's a lot of RDF. And most of it's going in the ground. I don't think they're carting it up to Queensland anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure. But it's going, in, but it'll eventually find its way into the water table or it will require councils and the long run marginal cost of the electricity which allows us to make the electricity available and sell it for an affordable level. We don't, we don't have to sell it for the same level as wind or solar. God bless them, they need to exist. But this is a different, this is a completely different animal. Um, it's cost savings in New South Wales alone of approximately $100 per ton. Again, we show that. Cleaner energy and energy affordability. We are not a virtually clean energy operation. Let's make that clear. We're not making that claim. What we are claiming is that we're considerably, vastly cleaner than all the alternatives. And this is a combination of waste disposal, or let's just call it recycling. It's recycling. It's recycling waste into energy um, and energy affordability. Now, the 405 ton per day project, as I indicated earlier, and Jerry will, will show you, he'll walk you through the mass energy balance on that. Um, at the time, and again, this is this is uh, nearly five years ago with, with Oz Industry, the metrics wouldn't have changed that much, really. Uh, the equity investment required was 55 million. The debt drawdown was 135 maximum. The gearing was 85 percent, and we had an EBITDA that was 3.3 times the interest for the interest coverage ratio, it was 3.3 times. Pretty sound. Uh, year one tipping revenue was 15 million, and that was based upon $85 a ton versus the 180 or so that they had to pay to tip just for the just for the fee. Um, the uh, energy revenue was also about 15 million, and so and then of course there were uh, renewable energy credits and a few other. Ups and ends. So the the uh, actually turned out to be close to thirty million dollars. The long run marginal cost again less than zero for the electricity. The financial return. Uh, someone puts in one hundred fifty five. Our me, fifty five. Eight years later, they get one hundred fifty million back. Even less than that. We figured they could get that back in about five to six years. Now, unless you've been a Bitcoin investor. <laughs> You don't see those kinds of returns on your equity. And uh, who knows where that's going to go. IRR 20%. Not gangbusters, but not, but not anemic either. Uh, and then the payback period is less than nine years. It's actually, it was actually just over eight years. Uh, and probably could have been accelerated a couple of years from that. So the project was expected to produce electricity and, of course, at a, a long-run marginal cost negative due to the negative cost associated with the generator fuel, i.e. the waste stream. The technology is exceptionally cost competitive with existing technologies such as coal and combined cycle gas turbines, which have long range marginal costs of, of Australian $50 to $80 per megawatt hour. From an investment perspective, the project is attractive as I've just stated. And, uh, and so we felt this was a strong case, while well, the industry also felt this was a strong case in their technical Jerry, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry, and he's going to discuss uh, some I'm of this. You, you, want, you want me to go through this? Yeah, okay. okay. <clears throat> so, what we did over the years is we put together with the you know, ma major costs in engineering uh, and, and major cooperation with the plasma company in the United States. Uh, we put together the feed system, plasma reactor system, gas treatment system, power generation system in a train said, this is how it will work. Where's the risk? The risk is in two things, mainly. And correct me if I'm wrong here. One is, is the operational risk, because nobody's ever operated anything exactly like this before. And tied to that is the development of a software program that, that works. Now, the reason we associated with the plasma company we've associated with over the years is because their software was really the only one in the industry at the time that was sensitive to the chemical heat inputs, the temperature controls, ability to move the arc torches around, and we are talking about plasma arc torches, not, not direct transfer torches, um, and, and, and 
and so forth. And, and uh, that provided a platform to be able to design uh, the control system for the entire project. And any project like this would have to have that done. And that was part of what we convinced all industry that we would actually do uh, during, during the period of project development. Independent economic and technology analysis supporting the business case from higher consulting, from, from uh, The other engineering group. Um, well, um, I can't remember their name now. <laughs> this is what happens when you get older. So they, 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 uh, anyway, we spent money up the yin yang and, uh, and, and time and materials and, and basically successfully tested, ultimately, based on those analyses, we successfully tested the material. And I'm going to show you. Uh, is that the Hyder report you're talking on? Well, the Hyder report was the first uh, risk report, and that was that was, and then there was the um, fatal flaw report. There were a number of reports. This is all available. Let's see. Sorry. Okay, now, uh, how do I? Do I just click on this. Oh, there we go. Okay, from 2008. This is when we had. This is Australian RDF. Okay. You'll notice the little particles dropping in. This is the test facility in Minnesota. And this is not an arc torch, this is a transfer torch. But you'll see, and it operates at a lower temperature, about 24, 2500 degrees. And you'll see the particles coming in, and they completely gasify, almost instantly. All right? These, these particles are a composite, represent a composite of the RDF from Terra Point that we had under contract at the time. That RDF was composed largely of uh, textiles, wood, uh, plastics of various kinds, right? As, as most RDF would be, and um, and you can see that the gas then has to circulate. Now, what the plasma company does besides develop the torches and the system and the control system is they're experts at charting the movement of gases because they got their start in the aerospace industry in the 50s. And they, they, were, they built the big vans, and they, they've got models of, very reliable models of how to chart gases. Don't ask me any questions about it, because I'm done with that point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but they're very good at it, and, they're, and they're, their record is very sound. And then, of course, we had the successful application for a multi-year commercialization award from Oz Industry. Now, challenges. As we, as we found out all along, up, up to the point where up to the point where the GFC hit, we actually had a financial commitment from Royal Bank of Scotland. But that came out about 10 days or 12 days before they were nationalized by the British government. <laughs> so that was gone. And they couldn't do this kind of investment anymore. They had to go back to square one, but during the GFC that was very difficult. Because if you weren't scraping ore out of the top of the ground, you weren't getting money from anybody at that point in Australia. So, or had some kind of dot com that made sense. So, the availability of finance in Australia, all sources want to be second cab off the rank. No problem doing the debt portion of the project, but you've got to get the equity. No problem getting the equity if you built the project and operated it. Preferably several in other countries. So this is, this is how it went. And practices of the waste industry, they're entrenched practices to maximize landfill regardless of cost. Witness, witness the fact that they were, for more money than they would pay us, they were trucking it illegally up to Queensland and dumping it there for $30 a ton, paying $100 to $110 just to truck it up there. God knows what their other costs were at this end. So uncertainty of Commonwealth state policies Australia is a nation of flip-flop on policy, I'm sorry to say. I've been here for 12 years, and, and I've not seen anything continue the way it needs to continue. Um, so, when we got involved in this, uh, one of the drivers was the Kevin Rudd election 2007, and oh, this looks good, this, might, this is one of the drivers, but we lost that one ultimately. Um, designing off-the-shelf technologies to work efficiently together for waste conversion to energy. Operational risks that are considered, I've referred to those before, but they're considered moderate. 
And we've got the independent analyses from the engineering companies uh, to, to prove that up, that, that those, those are moderate risk. Um, software design and implementation of a project control system, I touched on that before. And again, uh, I already mentioned you know, the, the Royal Bank of Scotland and the GFC years, the lack of, of equity um, waste companies. And uh, we were unable in the end, even with some assistance from some really top-notch people uh, uh, independently and associated with us firms, that uh, we were unable, and that included KPMG, Pottinger, etc., all in our corner, who were unable to get anyone to help us leverage the ATO or the uh, auto industry decision. As you know, you have to spend the money first to get it back. So I'm going to turn it over to Jerry and he'll walk you through the scale versatility of the system. Yeah, sure. Now, <coughs> commence with an apology. I think this is the one that pretty much illegible from where you're sitting. However, I'll just walk you through it briefly. <coughs> Jerry, excuse me a second if I may. Um, we've been told that this will be available uh, on the YouTube mm -hmm. site and also on the uh, smart you can, infrastructure site. It is legible. <laughs> <laughs> but let me take you through this. This, this is the plasma chamber. These are the inputs. There's the RDF going in. I'll talk about the properties in a moment. We've got an air supply which is enriched with oxygen because getting the chemistry right in here is fundamental to the city gas production. So there's an, there's an oxygen enrichment of the air supply and clearly there's the nitrogen going in as well. For certain RDF compositions you need extra water, steam for the hydrogen. So you can have, with it, there it is. In this particular case, the RDF sample we had, which I think this one was from India, as I know all, wasn't it? Bangalore. Uh, we didn't actually need, so it actually says zero kilograms per hour. But other RDF composites that we've looked at, we had to put steam in as well. So you then got the plasma torches and the energy coming in on the torches. It's Remind me, where is it? Three torches at 0.82 megawatts apiece? Well, three torches are for the 405 megawatts. Yeah. That's for Sorry. 135. This was a day. single torch. This is a single torch, yeah. Single torch. Yeah. Um, plasma. The uh, waste, vitreous material, and any, or any metal or anything like that is in the slag and it's tapped and then quenched. There is a better diagram, which there's some torch cooling air that's required to stop the torches melting for obvious reasons. Then it goes, sitting gas comes off at about 100, 1,000 degrees centigrade and is quenched and then scrubbed. It's a cooling process, obviously, but in addition to the, the quench. There's a certain amount of char that's taken out with bag filters that's come over with the process. And then we've got the cool sink gas at about 20 degrees, 27 degrees centigrade, which is then compressed before being used as fuel. Now, in this particular case, it's a 30 ton per day. The energy output, and, and I can read it, you can't, is 5.39 megawatts at high heating value, which we, in this particular configuration, we were going to use Genbacker um, diesels, which are this size we were looking at, and on um, this fuel had a thermal efficiency of about, a, a net efficiency of about uh, 42%. So, somewhere around two and a half megs. But there are some other waste streams in there, waste energy streams in particular, uh, cooling street steam, um, etc., which can 
in certain configurations be used in an expander to boost the power output. Uh, and we've looked at those as well. Now then, <coughs> oh, I got that. oh, sorry. That's it. Maybe able to read. <laughs> um, so this is starting to look a bit more like an integrated farm with some RDF storage. Clearly, that has to be a uh, hygienic arrangement because you have got smell from this material, and if you are going to live, situate the plant, you've got a social license to follow, so you've got that requires quite a bit of decent design. Shredder, take it down to 25 mils feedstock. Um, and if it needs drying, we put belt dryers in there. Then you've got the plasma chamber. Now, <coughs> the input energy for this 405, um, yeah, 405 tons per day, the CV was 19.4 megajoules per kilogram and 16.875 kilograms per hour. Now the software that Wes was referring to is some pretty sophisticated 3D finite elements software that plasma suppliers have developed over the years. It does not only the thermodynamics of the reactions, but also the reactions themselves. And that is what differentiates them from every other plasma supplier in the world at the primary uh, That's the clever bit. And that's why one can actually design them to regulate enhanced air, the torch air, and any C that's required. Um, so we've got the quench, and again, they've got the, the, the plasma company doesn't provide the, the quench towers, but it does all the design of the quench process. Again, use, utilizing their software. Uh, again, it's not available from others. <coughs> <coughs> Water treatment, mainly for acids that are taken out in the quench, and any solid material. Gas compression, in our case we were just looking at reciprocating compressors, fairly straightforward off the shelf. Um, gas storage, we needed flares because if the power plant went down we still wanted to process and 50% of our income comes from processing waste, the other 50%. So flares were, were, were built in there. In this instance, we looked at uh, a pair of um, turbines. I'm just trying to think of it. Who's the uh, solar? Solar. Yeah, I think it was solar. Uh, heat recovery and steam turbine. Depending on the NOx performance of the turbines, uh, you either have to have select, selective catalytic reduction or not. That's fairly straightforward. So you put in most gas turbines now, gas turbine suppliers, again, some very acceptable NOx figures. Excuse me, Secretary. I think it's important to note that what, what Jerry's walked you through here uh, is, is the is the project that LS Industry made its decision on. And behind that, it was a lady, by the way, late engineers. <laughs> yeah. And the French yeah, one, it was the a French cook, it was the French one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so late, but what Lady did was they sourced all the material, they sourced all the equipment for this complete equipment configuration, everything. Then we matched that with the needs of the plasma system. This was done properly, right? It's, yeah, to the point I think, I mean, at the end go. of the day, what you do here is a function of the price of power. It's an optimization. Does the extra 12 megawatts of the steam turbine warrant the extra 
the same energy on the NHL like skis and the turbine. Um, where power prices are at the moment, probably it does. But you've got to get it on, a, on, a, on an individual basis. And, and the, the power uh, consumed is in the 22% range. You, you generate, if you generate 10, you're going to consume 2.2. Yeah, just look at we, this one that works. We haven't got the power input no. into these, but the, I, <coughs> those were three torches. Three, tor three arc torches, that's right. Three arc torches at, I think, 900 kilowatts of torch. That's right. Nine, 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 nine. So, that's, and then three of those, so that's 2.7. About 9 megawatts. So, out of the, about this was, so these were about, we were ending up with about 26, 27 megawatts coming out for sale into the NAM. That's right, that's right. The, the that's right. 27. Which gets us below the 30 megawatt, which means that we're always dispatched. You, you know, if you're in the waste processing industry going on 24 hours a day, you can't afford not to be dispatched. So staying below 30 megawatts was a good thing to do. Also, there's a sort of, it's interesting, there's a sort of natural size to it because the lorry movements were manageable at that level. That's right. If you start going up to trying to shift, uh, there are projects around that are talking about six or 700,000 tonnes per annum. The actual number of lorry movements becomes a major issue. And I think that's one of the things that's the, the secrete project struggling with at the moment is the number of lorry movements and why they've had to reduce the size. But, um, but if anybody wants to get into debate and look at the mass energy balances for this one, please contact us because we've got it. With the, we have that level of detail which gives you the, the RDF characteristics mass balance and the energy balance for that the larger one. It's just, you know, for the purpose of presentation, we use this one. Okay. So, yeah, now there's a sort of, off we go into the blue yonder here. Uh, we, I, I would argue that we, the technology is well developed. Each component was available in the marketplace on a competitive basis, apart from the plasma torches, where the IP that the supplier had was unique. Proof of application, well, we've, we've run RDF tests. That is easily developed, you know, the, the, what, the cost of dumping waste here in New South Wales is well understood and is paid regularly. Um, we got to this stage, I, we, we, we had, we were ready to go with the front end design um, and it was going to be a turnkey project on an open book basis with, we a, we with uh, uh, technique, 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 the French company Technique, using their birth office. Uh, PB, we're going to act as the environmental consultants. Parsons Brick Hall, um, all of whom did their own due diligence, said, yeah, this will, this will work. They could see nothing, but we just couldn't raise that basic equity. So, somebody has an opportunity. Um, I'm not sure Wes and I have the energy to go around uh, talking to um, as many people as we did a few no, years we're, ago. We're, we're not. Uh What's the definition of Einstein's definition of insanity? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to do that. But, but I, I, I mean, but look, an we, I mean, we are occasionally somebody comes along and says, "Look, we'd like to talk to you." And you've got somebody at the moment from what must be the biggest market for waste uh, disposal, and that's China. And that's the obvious market, and they are prepared. Oh yeah, they are. You know, I mean, they, 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 that's. They, 
That's China betting on the future. And I will argue, if you follow the science of waste disposal, this is where you end up. But, you know, I'm happy to have a debate or an argument with someone. Yeah, okay. Okay, we've come to some conclusions and factors to consider that traditional finance <coughs> will not currently work for commercialization of these projects, uh, which leads to the conclusion, our conclusion, that in Australia, this would have to be done as a small project. There just isn't the appetite for anyone to walk out there and put 50, 60 million dollars or more worth of equity capital, even with uh, the, the ATO standing there saying, well, we'd probably give you nearly 40 million dollars of money back free and quick. So uh, we believe that we would get more traction with a smaller project in this market. The technology train will allow for mixed feedstocks under specific conditions and constraints. Uh, we can combine for instance, if you were doing RDF, you could also shoot liquid into, into the mix. You could have some of the nasty stuff that Orica is dealing with going in with the RDF. That changes the design of the plasma chamber, it changes, it changes the configuration and, and strength of the torches, but it's all doable. The plasma provider, by the way, has about 120 projects around the planet. And, uh, They've done everything from incentive, <coughs> high reduction, small waste of energy, uh, you name it. They, they've done work for the, you know, the military and the states, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we know that we can mix certain feedstocks, not, not every time, but you know, you don't want a you don't want a feed system that's too costly for the system that we design. The initial project size can be as small as 25 to 30 tons per day could be funded from more than one public-private partnership source. What we're trying to do here is simply telegraph some points to people who might wish to take this on from us, with us, etc. Um, LEP has an enormous cachet of technical and business information, you can only imagine, um, and relationships. And uh, we're, you know, we're, we've got a lot of goodwill out there still, uh, internationally and in Australia. And, and all represent a very good platform. The demand for waste energy with results offered is high in many parts of the world. I will reference that in China right now, there is a company, uh, Guangdong uh, Plasma Power, uh, that, is, that is building a facility based on ultra NRG, old Westinghouse plasma technology. And I think it's important to note here um, the differences between the people we've associated with and Alter NRG's technology. Alter NRG's technology, pl the plasma development, was arrested many years ago when Westinghouse was broken up and its pieces sold off. So that technology exists to clean up the dirty gases from other processes. It's not truly a garbage in, energy out situation. Um, and they are doing engineering studies they continue to do so uh, for the alter energy technology, but they're searching. There's money available in China, and there's intent, and there's policy, all combining. And there are several projects in China being developed at this point. There's one project done by a group called Bellwether. Our technology provider uh, provided them with the plasma system for a project in Czechoslovakia oh, about 12, 13 years ago. And the metrics came out so fine that uh, they, they are now in China, but they're not, they're not a municipal solid waste energy, they're an industrial solid waste energy. So they are recycling a lot of metals and precious metals and that sort of thing, and then using the organics to create energy. They, they have a project commissioned in China already, it's commissioned, and it looks like they're gonna be building another one real soon. So this whole, this whole sphere, sort of the gravity center is, Becoming China, as you would expect, but there are there are other people out there like us trying to push the concept forward. So, what direction? 
why are we here this morning? Um, we, we're willing to play active or background roles in this. We just want to see it go forward. And, and uh, the two of us are no longer at a point where uh, we're willing to put out the effort that we put out over the last 10 or 12 years. It's just, just not going to happen. Uh, however, we'd like to be involved as much as we can contribute. And we seek motivated and qualified movers who have technical and entrepreneurial qualities to look at the business anew. We're not saying we've solved all the problems. There are a lot of problems yet to be addressed in the development of the first project and its operations. But we do know that it's worth doing. We're very, 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 very firm about our, our belief and understanding of that. We will, under proper agreement, open our files, relationships, and expertise to those parties who wish to formally take on the challenge and potential rewards of successfully moving this business concept to commercialization. If there is a modest project where public and private funds are combined, that might be the optimal beginning because the operational risk of modest is spread. The initial customer should be a principal in the initial project, if possible. Who's the customer? The customer who's equity is whoever is going to get on buy the power or pay us to take the waste. One or two. That's the customer. If successful, the new managers of the effort will agree to compensate the current principles of LED waste and energy as participants and investors. Again, we're willing to be quite flexible, play whatever role anyone would see that we should play or could play, um, but we're not looking to, to uh, manage things with a, you know, with, with a microscope. LEP waste and energy principles are also open to act actively managing the effort through the first project if desired, but we prefer to play an advisory and collegial role. And this is kind of, we've been thinking about this for a long time, right, for, for more than a year about about how to how to address a group of people who have some technical understanding and interest in the subject and open up the dialogue. And um, Pascal and the smart infrastructure people have agreed, as many others have, Jerry, that this is a sound uh, a sound opportunity and a sound approach. So that's what we're here to do today. And we would encourage you to ask questions. We're we're available to you know, to dive into any issues you might uh, you might have, either today or otherwise. And um, here's our contact information. Um, and with that, I'll just open it up to any questions that you might have or any discussion. And um, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey, good day. Um, great speech. Thank you. Um, so there's two, I think, main issues, isn't there? There's like, um, what do you do with like waste? And how do you make energy? So your solution, how do you see that fitting in with, say, long-term views of, you know, um, sustainable energy and sort of trying to minimize as much waste as we can? So as, it, as energy becomes cheaper and waste becomes less, maybe you'd have less things to burn to create that energy? Yeah, and is that a risk or is that anything? And, and yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. I think, I mean, I think one, if one looks at the waste production, think of it as waste production, yeah. not energy. Yep. Um, you know, society is producing more and more of it. Yep. Um, the, the solutions are pretty ranging from picking waste, as we see in third world countries, uh, to dumping. Um, we see incinerators of varying descriptions based on either fluidized bed and chain head technology, all of which are left with the fundamental problem of uh, how you clean that exhaust gas up, in particular of the organic chlorides and dioxins. Actually, we now, unless society magically changes its uh, use of plastics to purely re recyclable ones that you can put in the ground and within five or ten years that problem is going to remain yeah. um, <clears throat> you know medical waste huge problem this is perfect for that medical waste at the moment is incinerated in a pretty crude way and the cleanup is pretty crude as oh, well yeah. oh. um, tyres now yes we may well end up with 
the demise of the internal combustion engine. It can't happen soon enough for me. Uh, but the tyres will still be there. This is perfect for disposal of that. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you go to Queensland, we've got the saga in the crowd of, of those mountains of tyres in Queensland and in Tasmania. Yeah, you know, those are two big problems pegging this as a solution. And I so I, I, I think if you think of it as waste, then what happens with, with, with the move to 100% uh, non-carbon generation, electric generation? It's immune to that. It all fits in. Yeah. And, and it's not big. Yeah. We've studied, we've studied the, the, the data for, that have come out for years uh, on, on this. And, on recycling, and we don't, we don't uh, overlap the recycling effort. But frankly, the recycling effort has reached its max on, on the current configuration and likely configuration of, muni of municipal solid waste. Is that we're recycling just about everything we can recycle out of it? We're not. We don't use that material. There's. If you look at if you look at the configuration of a ton of municipal solid waste, the typical configuration in New South Wales, you're going to get you're going to get about five percent, six percent metals. You're going to, you're going to get a, a, a liquid content that ranges from 35 to 55 percent. You're going to get and, and when that waste is processed, uh, the material that cannot be uh, uh, recycled, right? The organic material that cannot be otherwise disposed of is about 25 to 27 percent of the initial. Mix. So out of 100 tons, you've got 25 tons of fuel. Right? That, yep. and, and it isn't. It's not to say that it won't, but for the foreseeable future, I don't think anyone knows or anyone would think that that's going to change. But as Jerry says, if we move away from carbon, uh, you know, in, in our waste. That, that would change because obviously this is a this is a carbon solution. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question about uh, your project. But generally, the important thing is that when you want to select one uh, good technology, you should compare different things. And uh, for your project and for your the plasma, have some uh, advantage in comparison with uh, combustion. But uh, with gasification within the life bed, like photo te um, technology, I don't know what's the advantage because the investment in plasma is higher than uh, this type of technology. And uh, when I compare this, I understood that it's uh, maybe the best one for medical and hospital, uh, hospital waste, not for uh, uh, maybe municipal waste. And, and Another question is that about uh, your limitation for moisture of input and heat value, because uh, when the input change, everything will be changed. And uh, uh, if, uh, I, I know that, for example, when you uh, want to predict the composition of waste for 20 next 20 uh, years and something like that, you should be uh, maybe preferable uh, for changing composition. And if it's so important when you select one technology, this technology could be flexible with change the composition. How that's one of, its, that's one of its attractions. Well, I think that's a good yeah, question. Okay. I mean, that's one of its attractions. One of, one of its attractions is that it is adaptable to variations in the waste stream because we can adjust the input gases and the amount of moisture and the plasma power, etc. So we've got a number of variables that we can use to handle variations in waste stream. Um, uh, because the glass, one of the important things uh, in input is the percent of glass in uh, yeah. material. And uh, you have any uh, exact way to control the percent of in, uh, composition? You know no, that? we don't need I to. We don't need to. The, the, the you just point change this. I know that, uh, for example, you said that uh, with uh, uh, one stick in gas, you modify the gas for another step. It's true. But the important thing is the input. Yeah. You couldn't play the input more. So, no, but we can, but, but just bear consider? with me. If we put more energy in, we take the glass out and the slag. 
It alters the energy economics, yes, I quite agree. But we can put more energy into the torches. Well, and the, deal with more glass. And the RDF, the RDF. Doesn't the same with metals. Amounts. I mean, that's the point. It is actually very adaptable to those sort of changes in in in, in, in feedstock. But go back to fluidized beds, chain grates. What temperatures are we getting on the bed? 900 degrees centigrade. Not think much more. So you've got a fundamental problem in the waste streams coming off those technologies. And that's why I say follow the science. Get the temperatures up into the 1500 to 2000 degrees centigrade, and you don't have a problem with the organic, organic chlorides or the organic high halides. And when you speak about the organic material, you mean that uh, polymer material as well as uh, food, uh, food waste that waste from the food and something like that? Because well, that it's different, on the its value is completely yeah. different. And for example, when you speak about uh, waste in excuse developed me. countries... Excuse me a second. We're not talking about food waste. Food waste is otherwise processed. With, with the, waste a, a the RDF does not include food waste. It should be after the remove D. The RDF is a product of, yeah. of the waste mm -hmm. handlers. It's a current product mm -hmm. of the waste handlers process. What happens to the food happens to the food. We don't. After it. We're after that. So the, the refuse derived fuel is is that 25, 27 percent that's left over that must be put in the ground or incinerated. It's only two uses it's got. It can't be recycled. It, it has to be either incinerated or put in the ground. So they put it in the ground. And then you want to we might leave it to a private discussion because yeah. our, our eye is, our is up if we don't mind. Ricardo, if you take your question offline. Yes, um, sir. Can I, yes. we'll just, uh, we'll let it, let it talk privately. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming along. Thank, Thank you, you, Wes and Jerry. Very much appreciate that. Uh, please join me in thanking you.